Thanks, Mike, for the introduction and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, we're pleased to be up here this morning to explore a topic that I think is going to be interesting for everybody. And while these guys are getting uh, wired up here, um, let me just make a, a few um, introductory comments. Um, we're we're going to explore some what I guess we call alternative or non-traditional sources of funding, which I guess means anything other than venture capital, um, particularly for early stage companies. And maybe I can just share a, a few thoughts about some of the things that we've been seeing at Oppenheimer. We've been uh, heavily focused in the med tech space for 15 or 20 years now. And we work with a broad range of medical technology companies ranging from uh, raw early stage startups to venture backed companies to middle market public companies. Um, and at least historically, uh, the the bulk of those companies have been venture backed companies that are, you know, taking a new therapy through a clinical trial, running the regulatory hurdles and, and looking for uh, a commercialization stage exit exit kind of a thing. Um, and our experience has been, I think, similar to the data that uh, you saw this morning, the PwC data. Um, <clears throat> it seems like we've done m many more financings for our later stage clients. Uh, many of them have been looking for exits sooner than they otherwise might. At some days it feels like we're selling more companies than we're starting. But a couple of months ago I had occasion to actually count the number of new companies that uh, we started working with over the last year or so. And it was a surprisingly large number, more than it felt like anyway. But I would say that most or maybe even all of them uh, were pursuing alternative sources of financing um, really because that's all that was available to them. You know, things like government grant programs, um, angel groups, super angel groups, a anything but uh, traditional venture capital or at least traditional U.S. venture capital. We, we have, in fact, uh, been working with a handful of companies that um, seem to have had some success raising money in Europe. Um, typically that comes with it. A, uh, requirement uh, or, or at least a strong preference for some level of European operations, which um, could mean starting commercial operations, but it could also mean relocating and reestablishing the company in Europe. Um, and so we've seen that a little bit, but may maybe I'll start and ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves, maybe give a brief commercial about uh, the kinds of things that your firms do. And we'll just go from uh, this end to the other. Let's start with Matt. Sure, thank you. So Matt Rizzo, I'm with Orbit Med Advisors. Orbit Med is a healthcare dedicated investment management firm. The uh, firm itself has been around for over 20 years, currently has over six billion in assets under management. And that's across several different fund strategies, everything from private equity to venture capital to uh, public equity investments. Most recently last year, we raised a $600 million special situations fund. That's the fund that I'm involved with, and that's uh, really focused on more or less later stage companies providing uh, everything from royalty monetizations to non-dilutive uh, sources of financing. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Justin. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here representing Toronto Stock Exchange and TSX Venture Exchange. Uh, I'm primarily responsible for driving the business development initiatives on the listing side of the business uh, for both exchanges, TSX and TSX Venture Exchange, specifically as they relate to the, relate to the life sciences space. And as part of that mandate, uh, you know, I help to educate on the various you know, pathways that you can come to the market in Canada and uh, you know, help companies look at why they might consider Canada as a destination as opposed to other public markets. Uh, you know, on a global basis, we're, uh, we're quite competitive in the space. We've got, uh, at the moment, we've got 118 public companies listed between the two exchanges. Uh, I think that breaks down 67 on the Venture Exchange and 51 on the Senior Board. Um, about 10% of those are uh, in the med tech space. Uh, I think we've got 12, 12 of those uh, 118 are uh, US-based companies that have chosen to come to, to Canada. And, uh, you know, we've got um, a number of innovative ways to get to the market. I think we'll touch on one of those in, in a little bit, and, and that would be the Capital Pool Company Program, or CPC Program for short. So uh, we'll leave it at that. Thanks, Justin. And Dave Rosa from, from Sunshine Heart. 
Thanks. Um, Sunshine Heart is a company that has roots in Australia. You'll hear a little bit more about that and the financing process. Uh, the company now is incorporated in the U.S. Our headquarters are actually right out here in Eden Prairie. And what we're trying to do is um, commercialize a minimally invasive therapy for class three and early class four heart failure. Thanks, gentlemen. Uh, you know, let me start with uh, Matt um, from the investor side. Maybe you can just talk a little bit about uh, your perception of the uh, uh, investing market for medical technology and have you seen a change much in the last year or so since we were here a year ago? Sure. So my focus is actually a little bit more on the later stage at companies. So companies that are about to have a product approved or companies with revenue. And what we've seen actually, it's, it's been interesting. So it's obviously still very difficult out there to find uh, capital. And then when a company does find capital, then if it's equity capital, for example, then there's a uh, you know, sometimes painful discussion about valuation, especially if there's new investors coming in. And so what we've seen, and actually for both private and uh, public companies, public companies call it 200 million market cap or less, is there's actually been a more of a, a demand in the marketplace for some of these uh, alternative forms of capital. And that could be in the form of debt, it could be in the form of some kind of royalty monetization, or it could be in the form of, of some kind of hybrid investment that includes debt plus a royalty interest as opposed to awards in the company. And what we've seen, at least from my standpoint, it's actually becoming more competitive as an investor. And so as, as companies are becoming more aware of this form of alternative capital and are seeking it, what we're seeing is there's actually been some more players that have been coming into the market. And in the last couple of months, in fact, there's been uh, some transactions that were done that w we felt that were very favorable to companies. And so for companies that actually fit the profile for an alternative form of financing, what we've seen, at least uh, recently, is that the, the market has actually been, been improving for that form of capital. And Justin, um Maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, your perspective from north of the border in Canada. Is there a different perspective in the Canadian markets and the uh, yeah, investing I mean, in the U.S. and in particular in the med tech space? Well, I, I think um, y you know the, the sectors, the subsectors we're seeing the most traction in in, in Canada are uh, you know in, in the med tech uh, space, health healthcare technology, healthcare services, healthcare facilities. Those those subsectors are seeing. Uh, a little more traction, and, and we've, I think for the last two years, we've seen um, financing activity in the range of uh, just sort of between 500 and 600 million dollars. Uh, that compares, you know, historically prior to sort of 2007 and, and sort of the early 2000, you know, early to mid 2000s, where we're seeing a little over a, a billion dollars in the, sec in the sector being raised. Um, an important thing to, to recognize is that on aggregate, that money is being raised over the span of uh, anywhere from sort of 90 to 100, a little over 100 financing transactions. So that's been pretty stable over the last couple of years. But I think generally speaking, uh, you know, 2008 was a particularly tough year in the sector, as it was for all sectors. Uh, we've seen activity start to trend up uh, over the last couple of years um, in, in the life sciences space. And that's continuing, uh, we're see continuing to see that growth this year. So Dave, maybe you can um, talk a little bit about uh, your experience, uh, which is a unique one, and maybe I'll start out by asking, you know, why did Sunshine go to Australia for capital, and, and why should another company out here in the audience give Australia a thought? Uh, sure. So well, as I mentioned before, Australia, uh, I'm sorry, Australia, Sunshine Heart was founded in Australia um, by a surgeon that practiced there. And they didn't have necessarily the relationships set up in the U.S. to approach more traditional uh, venture capital. Um, and Australia is a market that is very different from the U.S. and how it looks at risk in early stage companies. So in Australia, uh, it's, there's a large mining um, infrastructure there. And most of the uh, investors there are willing to accept higher risk uh, or make higher risk investments because a lot of the mining investments that are made are boom or bust. Um, and when you think about an early stage medical device company, many of them you know, either go under or become very, very successful. That kind of culture you don't necessarily see here in the US. So because of their relationships uh, in Australia and the appetite uh, for the market, 
um, the company actually uh, decided to go public and they were actually able to raise um, in that initial IPO $15 million and have raised $60 million uh, since then. So number one, there's, there's a huge difference uh, in the markets uh, and that's really been our experience. There's, there's some other reasons why you might want to consider it. And again, I always start off with early stage company. Um, uh, we're not talking about later stage companies here, but as capital becomes tight in the US, it is an avenue for companies because there is an appetite. And the second uh, part is the Australian government uh, does a pretty darn good job of supporting companies that have R&D operations there. Um, this year, uh, there's actually no cap on the R&D reimbursement that you can get. So for example, uh, if you're a company, take an early stage company and your losses are less than $20 million a year, you can actually get a check back from the Australian government for 45% of all your R&D expenses. Pretty darn big number, and when you think about uh, early stage companies, a lot of the money is, uh, that you spend early on is spent in R&D. So just a follow up, Dave, uh, what kind of operations or connections do you have in Australia today? Uh, so we, we, have, we still maintain a research and development uh, organization there, it's very small. Uh, other than that, um, we have some investor relations people, but the balance of the company is located here in the U.S. Thanks, Dave. So, Justin, maybe you can uh, expand a little bit on your uh, the Toronto Stock Exchange and maybe in particular the CPC program that you mentioned a minute ago. Absolutely, and, and just uh, maybe just before I do that, uh, I'll just sort of echo uh, what Dave was saying. Um, you know, Canada, the Canadian capital markets are, are a lot like Australia in the fact that they've, you know, They've got a, a stable economy, high risk mentality amongst the investor base, and uh, you know there's a, there's a real strong support infrastructure for the earlier stage companies. And by that I'm talking about the investment bankers and, and the advisors on the street really support the earlier stage companies. So when you're thinking about Toronto Stock Exchange and TSX Venture Exchange, uh, it's important to remember that we have the two platforms. Uh, we've got the Venture Exchange is, is for the earlier stage typically for the earlier stage companies, and um, Toronto Stock Exchange, or TSX, is, is uh, for the, the more mature companies. And, and a typical path that we see are companies coming to the market uh, you know, at an earlier stage, getting onto the venture exchange, growing the business, you know, getting to a, a stage, a critical mass, where it makes sense to make that, that jump or that graduation up to the senior board. And in some cases, you know, we do see companies then uh, look at that dual listing uh, down here in the U.S. on, on NASDAQ. Um, and one of the ways that, uh, in fact, the most popular way that we're seeing uh, sp sort of these earlier stage companies coming to our market is through our, uh, our Capital Pool Company Program, or CPC Program for short, and some of you may have heard of it. Uh, it's, it's been around for about 25 years. It's not a, a new thing, and, and it was initially a program designed uh, specifically for the, the resources sector, oil and gas and, and mining, uh, and, and it's evolved over the years to, uh, to a program now where we're seeing more knowledge-based industries using the, the vehicle to go public. So we're seeing clean technology, we're seeing uh, technology, we're seeing life sciences companies using the, the vehicle to get public, sometimes on venture, but we have seen some larger companies actually use the vehicle and go, go right to the, the senior board. So essentially, and I'll, it, it, it's a little difficult to, to get into the nuts and bolts in, in a quick panel discussion, but I'll give you sort of the, the 30,000 foot level of how the program works. And by all means, you, know, you can come and see me after and we can, we can talk a little bit more about it. But essentially, if you think of the CPC as a, maybe as a mini SPAC is a good way to put it. So you've got a, a group of founders that come together these guys have, uh, these, these people have, um, you know, tenure in the public, public markets. They, they seed a, a CPC or a shell. That shell then goes through a public offering uh, process. They get 200 shareholders into that shell, uh, and it starts trading on the venture exchange. So you've got uh, a clean shell, no debt, no uh, legal problems. It's got cash on the balance sheet anywhere from 500000 to $5 million experienced management team, shareholders in there. They then have 24 months to go out and find a, a, what we call a qualifying transaction. Essentially, it's, a, it's, a, it's an RTO. So you, they go out, they find a private company, they negotiate a, a valuation, they come to an agreement in principle, they vend that company into the shell, 
And at the end of the day, you've got a public company trading on uh, either venture. Most, most of the time it's on the venture exchange, but sometimes you see them go right to the senior board. So it, you know, I've been told by companies that have gone through the process, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been efficient, they've been able to get to the market faster than they otherwise would have been able to. It has been less costly, and, um, and it's just been an all around uh, efficient process. So something, something to consider if, you know, if you're an earlier stage company, a uh, lot like what Dave was saying, if you're earlier stage, you know, VC doesn't make, maybe doesn't make sense, uh, maybe you're too small for the U.S. markets, then you, you look at, you could potentially look at this program as an option uh, in Canada. Thanks, Justin. Uh, Matt, let me uh, go to you next and, and ask you this. Um, you, you touched a little bit on some of the things that OrbMed is doing, but maybe you could expand on some of the unique uh, financing structures that you guys have put in place in the last year or two to sort of address this unique environment. Sure, and so really depending on the needs of the company, we've looked at situations that it's, it's a company that has a recently approved product. They're looking for a capital basically to, to fund a sales force. We've looked at situations where either a company with revenue or without revenue is actually looking to acquire a, ma a mature asset or a, a product that has revenues from, say, a larger company that's looking to spin something off. And so really, depending on the situation, we could uh, design something. So some, some recent structures that, that, we've, uh, that we've discussed with uh, companies, one in particular that, that's been uh, popular recently, especially for companies that have, have some form of revenue, but they're not profitable. So they're in a situation where, in terms of going to uh, traditional bank financing sources, some of the venture lenders may or may not be willing to, to take a certain level of risk on the product ramp, or it could be a situation where a venture lender is only willing to put so much money in. And so what we can do is if we get comfortable with the underlying intellectual property and the sales ramp, we could usually provide a financing. Our typical target is in the 20 to $50 million range. We don't necessarily need to have profits, but one thing that we've done recently is, uh, so it's effectively, uh, there's two broad categories. One could be a recourse structure, the other we we'll call it basically a non-recourse structure. So for a recourse structure financing, that is effectively debt into the company. We would have, we we'll call it a, a low-ish interest rate. And then in term, instead of a warrant kicker, what we would do is have basically a, take a royalty interest on sales. And so that's actually how we're sharing risk. With a, with a company, and in those structures, the trade-off is because we're getting some downside protection in terms of having a lean on assets, we're actually willing to trade that in terms of capping our upside. And so that, that's one of the, call it the more recourse type structures. In terms of a non-recourse, what we can do is even, this is actually, um, it can be for companies that have, say, royalty income, or companies looking to acquire an asset, we could set up basically a, a special purpose vehicle where the company would own the equity in the S SPV, and then we would effectively have a lien on the SPV. So an asset coming in, so it could be a development stage company acquiring a marketed product, the, the sub effectively acquires the asset, we would have a lien on that until we get our return. An alternative structure of a company looking to monetize a royalty could also be a, effectively, aside from a straight royalty sale, it could be more of a royalty bond-like structure, again, non-recourse, where you would set up a sub, company owns the equity, there would be uh, an interest rate in principle associated with the debt, and then there could even be, a, so as the royalty income comes in, a percentage, it doesn't have to be 100% sweep, but say 75% could go to service the debt, 25% goes back to the company, and then once the debt's fully retired, the company retains any kind of residual royalty interest. And so those are some of the, the more recent structures that, that we've been uh, discussing with uh, companies. Uh, thanks, Matt. Um, just I'll pause here. Uh, we are open to questions. Um, love to have them either now or throughout the, um, our, the balance of our 45 minutes. And we'll save, uh, we'll save a few minutes at the end um, if people want to have questions, but if anything, if there's anything you want to ask uh, before then, uh, just find one of the IBF folks and we'll get your question to the pa one of the panelists. Um, Dave, you know, Sunshine raised um, capital, went public on the Australian exchange several years ago. You know, tell us a little bit about what life has been since then. Has it proven to be a successful vehicle for Sunshine? I know you've uh, raised quite a bit of capital since then and has it helped or been a, a handicap in your subsequent financing events? Well, I think just, <clears throat> excuse me, being a public company, especially for an early stage company, uh, what life is like is you spend, um, you know, I'll ballpark at 
at times 75 percent of your time dealing with things that you know public companies uh, deal with whether it's you know meeting with analysts shareholder meetings preparing shareholder reports lots of things that you traditionally would not um, expect to do if you were an early stage company and we actually have a dual listing so um, we're listed on NASDAQ as well as, as um, the Australian Stock Exchange, and some of the requirements are different. So um, you are going to spend more time. Has it been a uh, useful vehicle? The answer is absolutely yes. I think you know, some of the frustration at times when you're looking to raise early stage capital is the process as you're meeting with investors can go on for quite, quite a long time, uh, you know, quite possibly a year, maybe longer. Um, in the public markets, um, you know, the one thing that you typically see is um, if you get a no or a yes, it's usually fairly quick. Um, you, you may have a few meetings. The diligence process is, is much quicker. And quite frankly, um, you know, I would prefer to have a, a quick no than, than find out a year later after investing a lot of time and resources that, uh, that the answer is no. Uh, the downside is, um, you know, in, in addition to just some of the activities that I said you'll be responsible for doing, You'll get all kinds of advice from shareholders, um, you know, that own uh, 100 shares of your stock, you know, maybe $100 worth of your stock. Um, I have my, my favorite shareholder uh, every week sends me an email. A few weeks ago it was, uh, there's a picture of you with a red tie on the website. Um, that really represents arrogance. Why aren't you wearing a blue tie? Uh, today I'm wearing a red tie, so I obviously haven't taken her advice Oops. yet. But. Um, <laughs> But, I mean, quite frankly, that, that is, you know, one of the issues. And then the volatility of the share price, which I'll address a little later, um, you know, we released data um, that uh, was very positive from our feasibility trial. And three hours after the release of that data, uh, we inexplic inexplicably had a uh, transaction or a trade of $9.10 um, uh, in, in terms of sale of our shares. And that dropped our market cap 30% uh, on that one trade. So there are some, some frustrations with that. But all in all, uh, you know, again, I think if you're early stage, you've tried the traditional venture capital route, um, you're, you're really hitting a roadblock there. Um, this is still an avenue that, uh, that you should investigate. And Dave, just to follow up on that, uh, talk a little bit about other companies that you know of who have US companies that have raised money in the same way. Uh, sure. Well, I'm going to have to refer to my notes if I can actually read them so I don't get any of this wrong. But um, when you look at uh, the Australian market and the, the companies that I'm going to mention, one of them has been mentioned today actually as, um, as, as a success story. But these are all either U.S. companies that, are, that have done a listing on the ASX or in some cases dual listed. One of them is listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange. So Riva Medical is a company you may be aware of. They had filed an S-1 in the U.S., um, uh, ran into some difficulties um, in the financing, uh, pulled that S-1, went to Australia, um, raised $85 million. The, the valuation was a little bit above $200 million. And the, you know, the share price has really fluctuated uh, between $0.62, cents, or I'm sorry, $0.50 cents and $1.28. And they, they went public uh, at $1.20 something. Uh, the share price right now is at $0.62. Cents. Uh, they have corporate investors in the company. Um, they, to my knowledge, have not released any, uh, any negative uh, data. Um, they recently had an investor in New York take about 7.5% of the company, yet the share price is where it is. Bionish is a company that's on the Toronto Stock Exchange. They raised $12.5 million in an IPO on the ASX. Their share price right now is $0.45. Cents. They went public at a dollar, uh, I think it was a dollar 45. Uh, GI Dynamics is the success story in this group. They raised uh, approximately 80 million. Valuation was uh, above 300 million. And their share price is held uh, from the IPO. And then most recently, uh, another local Minnesota company, Osprey Medical, had spent uh, at least 12 months exploring venture capital, very early stage company. Um, went and um, had some initial discussions with um, investment bankers in Australia. Uh, they, they listed last week. They were able to raise $20 million uh, in Australia. So there, there are examples of companies that clearly have had success raising the money. 
Uh, I think uh, the hard part is raising the money, and then the hard part is spending the money and, and meeting your obligations. So it doesn't get easier. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Justin, can you talk a little bit about who these investors are in the, um, as you call them, CPCs or special SPACs, and what are they looking for at the end of the day? Well, I think, uh, you know, and I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but, uh, you know, the Canadian capital markets are unique in that they've really got a, a robust retail uh, investor component underlying, and, and they play a big part in investing in the, in the CPC structure. I mean, there are institutional investors that get involved, but uh, I think it, you know, the retail investor is, is, plays a big part in, uh, in the success of the CPC program. Um, you know, there are, we do have founders, CPC founders that, you know, routinely set up these shells. They, this, is their, uh, this is their bread and butter. This is what they do, and they do a good job at it. They'll do two or three. Uh, I think, sorry, I think we can do two. They can have two going at any given point in time, but they've got a team, and um, you know they've got a number of success stories behind them. So investors have come to know these successful uh, founder groups. They follow them, and uh, you know they're, they're invariably sort of asking, you know, when is the next when is the next shell going to be set up? We want to get we want to get behind it, and and the shells, um, you know, they, they when they uh, when they set up and they they're trading on the market, they often uh, you know, they don't have to, but they often will you know specify a sector of interest, um, you know, whether it's a mining, uh, a mining focus or a knowledge industries focus or technology focus, whatever it may be, we actually keep a list of those CPCs on our website and it's there specifically for, uh, for people like you to actually, you know, access it at your convenience, check out, you know, what CPCs are out there, it has, the, you know, their, the phone number, the main contact, how much money's in the shell. Uh, what their industry of focus is, uh, that sort of thing. So we we certainly encourage people uh, and try to point people to that list um, uh, to to you know pick up the phone, give them. If you're thinking of the public markets and the CPC program is of interest, you can give you know give them a call and they can uh, they can certainly have a chat with you. Uh, I do keep relationships with a number of these sort of what I call serial CPC founders, the guys that, that do it on a regular basis. Uh, so I you know I'll certainly help make introductions where, where it makes sense. Um, uh, but, you know, to answer your question from an investor standpoint, um, the retail investor plays a big part. And the typical profile of companies that, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that are coming in the life sciences space that are coming to the market, I mean, we don't have a prerequisite for having revenue. I think it depends on the, uh, the subsector that you're, you know, you're, you're talking about. Um, I, I think you know, the typical profile is a company that's, that maybe that is pre-revenue, you know, they've got $20, 30000000 million in, in private venture capital already invested in the company, they're looking for a larger raise um, to, to, uh, to maybe, you know, support their phase three clinical trials. I mean, a good example is we, we had a, uh, a company last year um, called Trimel Pharmaceuticals. This is uh, Eugene Melnick's um, latest uh, baby and, and uh, you know they were successful in using the CPC program um, I believe they raised around 30 million dollars on this. so what so basically the, the shell was there was a shell trading that came together with Eugene and his Trimel Pharmaceuticals they negotiated a deal they ended up doing the qualifying transaction and at the time of that qualifying transaction they they went out and they raised 30 million dollars uh, via private placement in the market so uh, so that was uh, an interesting story um, that uh, that took place in the in the space and do those early investors uh, look to exit through just trading in the market or through acquisition or both? Uh, sorry, the... Um, the early investors, when they look to exit their investment. Oh, the, uh, the guys that are seeding the, uh, the CPCs? Right. Uh, it, it, it depends on... It, every situation is different. And, and when, they, um, you know, when they go out and they find their qualifying transaction, they negotiate the deal with the, with the management of the company, um, you know, they, they, uh, they can negotiate staying on the board of the company, they can negotiate, uh, you know, not being on the board. It depends on every situation. Thanks, Justin. Uh, we've got about uh, a little over 10 minutes left. Maybe I'll stop now um, and see if we have any questions in the audience for any of the panelists. Well, let me, uh, let me put another question then. Uh, this one for you, Matt. Uh, maybe you could elaborate a little bit on uh, 
kind of what you are looking for uh, profile-wise uh, when you make an investment, and and for companies that might be interested in approaching Orbimed, you know, what kind of recommendation would you give companies? Sure. Well, one nice thing about Orbimed in general is what we try to do when we see a potential investment opportunity is try to find effectively the, the right home with an Orbimed. And so, as as mentioned, we have a wide range of fund strategies, and so. It, you know, is it more appropriate for our, our venture capital fund versus maybe it, the investment can come out of our, our one of our public equity funds or maybe even the, the royalty fund itself? And so that's a combination of a lot of different factors. I think first and foremost, it depends what the company is looking for. Are they looking for only equity? Are they looking for something more structured or that they open? And then from that standpoint, we try to identify, you know, just, just from a risk profile where it, would, where it would fit. So something, so a company that has something that's a little bit more predictable in terms of uh, revenues, it, it could be effectively a boring product, but a, but a steady product. That might be something that would be appropriate, say, for, for, for our special situations fund. If something requires that there's, you know, even a small baseline or no revenues, but there could be a lot of a potential upside, then that might be a conversation that would be for, you know, for our venture fund or even our uh, public equity fund. But speaking from the standpoint of, uh, I guess, the topic in terms of the non-conventional sources of financing, what I would typically look for, one of the, the mandates in our fund, in addition to, to being something that's either commercially available or close to commercially available, we look at the, the intellectual property. A lot of our investments are really need to be backed by intellectual property, so that's really part of our due diligence process. It's not to say that we would invest in situations that don't have strong IP, but that's usually, uh, just in terms of, the, as, as we look at, at certain situations, that's certainly a requirement. And then just in terms of all the risk factors, again, though we're likely not taking clinical or regulatory risk on a certain situation, there is commercial risk, which was uh, discussed a little bit in the previous panel. But the situations that we deal with are a lot of times are, are companies that, again, the product is, is on, a, on a ramp. And so it's really being able to predict and get comfortable that sales won't just bottom out or sales will continue to grow. And so there's a whole host of factors Everything from uh, who is selling the product, the commercial infrastructure, to the you know the reimbursement landscape, the future competitive landscape. So we just go through our, our full full analysis. But simply speaking, we like to so situations for the really for the non-conventional sources of financing uh, that lend themselves well to that are situations where revenues are relatively predictable within a certain range that we can get comfortable with d designing a, a structure around. Because in the end, uh, we're a long-dated investor. Or we're typically looking at, a, for this fund, a, a five to seven year horizon. And so we want to be there for the long run. And so we, we don't want things to go wrong. We don't want to be in a situation where that we would have to have a difficult conversation with the company. So a lot of that speaks to our initial underwriting to really get comfortable with, uh, with the, the, the visibility of the cash flows. Hey, Tom. could it, um Go ahead, Dave. Can I maybe uh, comment on um, just what happens when you go public and maybe some of the things that you can do to address share price? Terrific. That'd be great. Uh, so one of the comments that I made uh, earlier was, or some of the examples I gave were companies that, uh, whose share price drifted over time. When you look at, um, when you go out and you do an IPO in Australia, quite frankly, a lot of times um, the majority uh, of the uh, stock goes to large institutional investors who have no interest in trading the stock. They're holding on to it for a longer period of time. Um, and unless you have a retail component um, uh, to your offering, there's not going to be any trading, or you're going to be susceptible to what Sunshine Heart was, where one trade, uh, one small trade, has a great impact on the company. And if you expect to do future financings, that could really, really hinder your ability um, you know, to, uh, to, to have success, or to minimize dilution. So when I came to Sunshine Heart, um, you know, I had, uh, I had never been involved with a public company. Well, I should say I'd never run a, a public company before. And my question was, uh, and I asked this to analysts, I asked this to the board, I said, what do you need to do uh, to be successful and, and get the share price up? And they all collectively said uh, at the same time, what you need to do is hit your milestones. So I said, great, you know, I will um, uh, under promise and over deliver. Uh, you know, the traditional thing that CEOs do, or at least I do. So um, uh, what wound up happening was, for the last couple of years, we've had our milestones, and the stock has gone down. So I, I, I can tell you that, um, and, I, and I asked this question to one of the, um, one, 
One of the uh, Australian analysts who's a little bit uh, better known uh, in the industry, and I said, explain this to me. You guys all told me two and a half years ago, hit your milestones, the stock will go up, it'll take care of itself. What's the deal? Uh, and his comment, uh, his, his exact, his exact uh, response was, Dave, when you release good, good information, the stock goes down. When you release bad information, the stock goes down. The stock just goes down. You know, live with it. Uh, raise the money at whatever price you can and, and deal with the death threats from investors, you know, uh, as you need to. But, um, you know, obviously hitting your milestones, having a presence in Australia, meeting with investors, all the things that you would expect to do anyway are, are obviously things that uh, you have to do, but it doesn't guarantee necessarily success. Um, there have been other things that have triggered um, uh, improvements in share price, having a corporate partner, certainly having a, a well-known large anchor um, uh, investor uh, helps. But I can tell you after really scratching my head for the last two years and speaking to other CEOs where you saw share prices that were pretty constant you know, for a year or so, and then all of a sudden on one day, the stock doubled or tripled. And, and these are, again, early stage companies that are public that I'm referring to. The most important thing these CEOs have told me is that th there wasn't any announcement they made about the company, there wasn't any investment that they received, any corporate partnership. It was the use of social media. And the use of social media really spurred retail interest in the stock. Uh, and that was the single largest driving factor. It was a blog that was done maybe on uh, um, or an entry that was done on a financial blog by you know, uh, an investor, not even a well-known investor. Um, and, and the more uh, the company shows up in social media, it seems, according to these CEOs, um, uh, that, that's what they directly related the increase in their share price to. So people have said, well, why don't you just talk to analysts? You know, get your analyst coverage. And companies always say, you, know, you guys have analyst coverage. Um, you know, that's what we're, we're trying to get analyst coverage. In my experience, analyst, analyst coverage helps with your institutional investors. It doesn't have the same impact um, on retail investors, and that's just my experience. So um, we could probably spend a whole session on social media, but um, as unimportant as I thought that was, it's become the most important thing, uh, at least for the early stage companies that I've spoken to. And just a follow-up, Dave, you recently uh, listed on NASDAQ. What was the reason for that, doing that? Uh, I, I just needed another outlet to, to beg for additional money. Um, um, but uh, in, in all honesty, I mean, we, we, you know, Mike was my mentor at Boston Scientific. He's been laughing at me the entire session. Um, anyway, uh, we were looking for uh, another avenue to raise capital um, because we are, um, we obviously have a large pivotal trial uh, that we're going to undertake sometime this year. So it just exposes us to, to being able to raise additional capital outside of just uh, Australia. So we've just got a few minutes left, um, and maybe I'll uh, ask again if there's any questions. Um, please let us know. Um, and if not, maybe each of the panelists can make a few just closing remarks. Maybe I'll start with Matt here immediately to my left. Um, any final comments, words of wisdom you might have for folks? Sure. Well, I think you know non-conventional sources of financing, in terms of is how how we look at it and define it, can be useful. But I think it's it's obviously important for for both sides to really evaluate evaluate what's the most appropriate form of capital. And so that's um, it, it's everything from you know who who is who is on the other side. So if it's a company raising money, is it is it a longer-term investor? Is it an investor that can actually help with some kind of strategic process at some point? That's important. I think it's important to uh, look just in terms of some of the history as far as, especially in the non-conventional world, in terms of how some of the investors uh, may have um, behaved in the past effectively when situations have, uh, have not worked out, because that, that'll be important. And then the other thing in terms of just having the extra dry powder for in terms of future financings, then I think you know, that's one side of it. The other side of it is looking at it from a, the, the various trade-offs from a cost of capital perspective in terms of not only what is the most uh, kind of desirable cost of capital, but with the non-conventional sources, uh, the cost of capital may arguably be lower than equity, but then there may be certain covenants associated with that. So it's really the whole package.
but it's a situation, as, as mentioned, especially for companies with a revenue, something that, that we've seen. Uh, there, there's, there's been more and more interest, I think, from an investor standpoint in the market. And I think as companies understand how some of these uh, facilities work, then I think that, that there's, uh, what we've seen anyway is a little bit of an uptick in uh, financing from some of the more non-conventional sources. And Justin, how about you? Any final words of advice from Toronto? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, being a public company is not for everybody. I understand that, um, you know, but I always, if it's, if it's something that you might be thinking of, uh, you know, two to three years down the road or eventually at some point, you know, I'm always happy to have a discussion. And that's what I'm, I'm at the exchange for. Uh, I get calls every day from, from early stage companies from all around the world that are just say, like, you know, we, we heard about... Uh, your venture exchange. We heard about the CPC program. It sounds really interesting. Does, you know, does it make sense for us? Can you walk me through uh, the process, how it works, the listing requirements? Um, and, and so that's that's one of the things that I do. And you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, if 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 there is if it makes sense, then uh, then I can take that further and make introductions to uh, you know to some of the people on the uh, the street in uh, in Canada that can help help through the next sort of stage of the process and uh, I just might point out that I've got a, a, a small delegation of, of some of those uh, experts with me here in Minnesota so by all means um, I'm happy to make some of those introductions for you uh, you know but at the end of the day you know it really comes down to uh, you know if it's really something that you're looking at doing then uh, it's, it's never too early to start getting your ducks in a row and, and start acting like a public company uh, you know well in advance and then that just makes the process a lot easier when it when you do come to the time when you want to come to the table. So. Thanks, Justin. Uh, Dave, why don't we give you the final word? Any final comments you want to make? I think if you're in an early stage company and you've explored uh, the traditional paths of, of accessing capital through venture capital and you're finding either resistance or not having success, you should consider looking at um, uh, the public markets, whether it's in, in Canada or Australia or, or some other avenue. It just expands your ability to to get access to capital. Thanks, Dave. Well, and uh, thanks to the panel for uh, being here today. Uh, we will all be here, I'm sure, throughout the day. Uh, if you want to catch us afterwards, we've got a short break coming up uh, over lunch, whatever. Please join me in thanking our panel this morning. <laughs>